Now at 5 and streaming on CrossroadsToday.com, authorities give an update in the death of an Edna cheerleader. This as one suspect now arrested in her death. Plus, indictments made in the case of a stolen tabernacle from an L. Campbell church. We have the latest details in the investigation this afternoon. And we continue following the latest developments in the deadly Israel-Hamas war. After a cold start to the morning, we're looking at cloud cover rolling back in. That's actually going to give us some milder weather, and we'll be talking more about that coming up in a moment. Plus, in a groundbreaking legal battle against the state's strict abortion ban, a woman leaves the state to receive the procedure while the legal battle plays out. You're watching 25 News Now at 5. Good afternoon and thanks for being with us. I'm Karina Garcia. A man has been arrested in connection with the killing of a 16 year old cheerleader from Edna. Elizabeth Medina was found dead by her mother in her bathtub just last week. The suspect has been identified as Rafael Romero. He is arrested for capital murder, which makes him eligible for the death penalty if convicted. Members of the community mourned the victim at a vigil Saturday night. One family member had said Elizabeth aspired to become a nurse. Now 25 new now has obtained the preliminary autopsy results on 16 year old Liz Medina. The report said that Medina died from quote sharp force injuries unquote. A final report is pending. Now the 23 year old suspect arrested in the case remains at the Jackson County Jail in lieu of a $2 million bond. This week, we continue introducing you to the candidates running for mayor of Victoria. 25 News Now anchor Don Brubaker has Peter Brown with him today. All right, Karina, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Brown. We appreciate you coming by. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Why do you want to be mayor of Victoria? Well, why not? I think everyone, <laughs> I think everyone at some point wakes up one morning and says, you know, I want to be mayor or, or some political individual or position. And uh, not that that's their life mission, but it uh, comes across as a position of, of some importance and, and uh, can benefit a community greatly. How long have you had a goal of running for mayor? Uh, to be honest, about as soon as the uh, the current mayor is, uh, announced his resignation. Wow, so yeah. you just jumped right in there. Yep, I, I made the calculated decision and said, you know, if there's any chance that I can just come in there and, and be voted mayor, this will be it. Uh, it's kind of a confusing thing, not many people are paying attention. Uh, to this new ballot, but I said I, I might as well do it right now. It's not a full length term and, and that sort of thing and, and see how much good we could all do in that brief period of time. Well, look, let's look at the ballot. You got six candidates and the election is going to be here in less than two months. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare for a, a very quick campaign? It's, it's going to be tight. Uh, it's still in the planning stages right now, but it's going to be a kind of a shock and all campaign, if you will, uh, has to be since mm -hmm. we're in the gun, but uh, it'll be exciting nonetheless. Mm -hmm. The biggest problems that you see right now in the city of Victoria? Well, I think right now the, as a whole, the city is doing great. I think the current mayor is doing great and city council, uh, but I, I foresee housing being the most uh, prominent hurdle that Victoria has. It they, It's just, it's in a slump. Mm -hmm. and they need to bring that out. Mm -hmm. What about roads? Roads are actually doing, despite belief of a lot of people, they're actually doing pretty good and keeping up pretty well, all things considered. Um, but r roads just, uh, I forgot the mileage of total roads in Victoria, but it's astronomical. It's more than going us to go to Dallas. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of roads. But just because they're not being repaired in front of your house or your place of business doesn't mean that they're not being uh, fixed somewhere else and they'll get around to yours since they haven't already. Uh, that's just usual things I hear uh, people complaining about. Mm -hmm. Also, Victoria Fire Department needs a new chief. So what are the things you're looking at there from the candidates? Always, I'm a little kept out of the loop on that right now, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, but always someone that's that's a team player uh, that definitely wants to be there and and has the greater good in mind. All right, all right, very good, Peter Brown. We thank you so much for coming by. Uh, one of the candidates for mayor of Victoria, Karina. Back to you. 
John, thank you. Illegal dumping of trash within Victoria County is a problem that keeps getting increasingly more messy, causing county commissioners to find out a way to clean up this mess and expensive problem. Kenneth Sexton, precinct four commissioner, says the dumping of trash is increasing inside his precinct at a rapid rate, causing leaders to neglect other projects in order to clean up the dump site, and that's just the beginning. It's just complete disregard to public property. And, um, you know, we, we estimate it costs us over $1,000 every dumping to clean up, not to mention law enforcement investigation time. He says the county is looking into installing cameras and increasing patrols in known dump site areas. The county has designated courtesy trash stations along with recycle stations located in precincts one and four, and they can be used by any Victoria County resident. Now, for more information, visit the VictoriaCountyTexas.org website or to report illegal trash dumping, call 911. So here is your beer poll this evening. You can scan that QR code on your screen to vote. The question is, are you concerned about the illegal dumping of trash in your neighborhood? Yes or no? We want to hear your opinion on this. Come to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to take part. And of course, you already know we're going to have an update later tonight at 6. And with that, let's shift gears and take a look at the weather with first with meteorologist Mac Perez. Mac, how are you today? Happy Monday. Good. Happy Monday. Uh, we are looking at the cloud cover that's rolling back in you know it was a clear cold morning dipping down to almost freezing uh, but by tomorrow we've got mild air rolling back in and we've got rain by the end of the week all that coming up in just a moment Mac, thank you. The two men accused of stealing religious items from St. Robert's Catholic Church in El Campo back in September, and the woman police say helped hide the stolen goods, now indicted by the Wharton County Grand Jury. The El Campo Leader News reports 29-year-old Jose Jarmilio and 44-year-old Thomas Graham were linked to the church theft, as is 61-year-old Sandra Hedges. The grand jury issued two count indictments against Jarmilio and Graham, and a single count indictment was issued against the woman. Attorneys for a pregnant woman who sought court permission for an abortion said she left the state to obtain the procedure. 31-year-old Kay Cox waited for a ruling from the state Supreme Court on whether she could legally obtain the abortion under the state's strict exceptions. A judge gave Cox permission last week, but that decision was put on hold by the state's all-Republican high court. In a twist to the historic case over access to an abortion, 31-year-old Kate Cox has left Texas to terminate her pregnancy legally, according to her lawyers. Nancy Northup, head of the Center for Reproductive Rights, said in a statement she's been in and out of the emergency room and she couldn't wait any longer. Cox is trying to get an emergency abortion after doctors said her 20-week fetus has a severe condition called trisomy 18. Trisomy 18 is a genetic disorder. Estimated 90% of children die before birth, and those that live past birth usually have multiple life-threatening problems. Cox says her doctors also warn if she continues to carry the pregnancy to term, it could jeopardize her health and future fertility. There's no outcome here, you know, that um, results in us taking home a healthy baby girl. A lower court judge granted Cox the request for an emergency abortion, but Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton stepped in and appealed the ruling, asking a higher court to intervene. The Texas Supreme Court is now reviewing her case. Plaintiffs have not shown that they will suffer an immediate and irreparable injury. Paxton writes in a court filing that the fetal condition does not meet the medical exception in the state's law banning abortions, except if the woman's life is at risk or if it prevents irreversible damage to major bodily functions. Outside the Texas Supreme Courthouse, protesters are rallying behind Cox. Time is of the essence. I mean, the clock is ticking every day that goes by. The risks to her health and life and future fertility increase. Texas is one of 21 states enforcing abortion restrictions since Roe v. Wade was overturned last year. Cox's attorneys say she is not giving media interviews and will not disclose her location. Jacqueline Lee, ABC News, Los Angeles. Israel's defense minister pushed back against international calls to wrap up the country's military offensive in the Gaza Strip, saying the current phase of the operation against the Hamas militant group will, quote, take time, unquote. In an interview, he refused to commit to any firm deadlines, but he signaled the current phase could stretch on for weeks and that further military activity could continue for months to come. Israeli troops continued in fierce battles with Hamas militants in the southern and northern areas of Gaza. 
Authorities in D.C. cited 18 people today after they chained themselves to the White House fence. The group has called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Before U.S. Park Police intervene, they chanted, quote, Biden, Biden, pick a side, ceasefire, not genocide, unquote. The president was in Philadelphia attending a campaign fundraiser. Park Police say each protester was cited and then released at the scene. State universities are facing pressure to respond to tensions from the Israel-Hamas war. You can read more about this by the Texas Tribune on our CrossroadsToday.com website. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click that notification bell. For now, stay with us. Straight ahead on 25 News Now at 5, 15 people are facing disciplinary action following the investigation of the Massachusetts National Guardsmen. Also ahead, residents are picking up the pieces in Tennessee after a tornado moved through the area over the weekend. Fifteen people had been disciplined in connection to the online leaks of government secrets. This for failing to stop a Massachusetts National Guardsman from posting classified defense documents on Discord. The investigation found that some of Jack Teixeira's superiors unit knew about his intelligence seeking behaviors, but failed to report it. Fifteen people from the ranks of staff sergeant to colonel were disciplined. Jack was indicted on six counts of willful of willful retention and transmission of classified information. Now, at least three people were killed when a tornado tore through Clarksville, Tennessee over the weekend. Several homes were destroyed with thousands left without power. Crews are saying it can take weeks before power is fully restored. Several residents had to be transported to area hospitals and schools in the area are expected to be closed today and Tuesday. Some residents say this all happened very fast picked me up. I was trying to go in the closet when I got that alert. I just remember opening the closet door and just turning around. The wind just took me and I just remember waking up on this side of my house looking for my home and then I saw my children over there and my husband was in the debris back there. I went back barefooted. I didn't have on any clothing hardly just a robe and helped him up and across the street. So yeah, it's pretty quick. The National Weather Service had reported an EF3 tornado moved through the area with winds of up to 150 miles per hour and a path of 600 yards wide. For those worried about putting on holiday weight this season, health experts have ways to avoid packing on those holiday pounds. Here's more. From holiday cookies to cakes and carbs, overdoing it on holiday treats can be the gift that keeps on giving. The average person gains about a half a pound to one pound during the holiday season. Dr. Jesse Bracamonte with Mayo Clinic says many people don't lose that weight. Over time, it can add up. It puts us at risk for problems such as diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, some types of inflammatory problems such as even some cancers. Maintaining a healthy weight during the holidays can be hard. Bracamonte says it's okay to enjoy food you love, but be strategic. Stay on your focus mealtime plans, which means if you have breakfast, have your breakfast, stick to your lunch, 
Try not to overindulge and skip meals. Rocamonte says to limit sugary drinks and alcohol, which can add empty calories. Remember to keep up with exercise, even a 10-minute walk before or after holiday gatherings. Control your stress level. We tend to eat more when we're stressed. And don't graze at those gatherings. Have a small plate to place the food on. Rather than doing the eat and peck method, you tend to eat more calories with that. Having a smaller plate may help to kind of limit those calories. Finally, slow down and savor the holiday food. You're typically going to be more conscientious of what goes in your mouth. And plus, what goes in your mouth, you must enjoy. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Governor Greg Abbott participated in a menorah lighting ceremony in Austin Sunday on the fourth night of Hanukkah. Rabbis and other members of the Jewish community join Abbott and other faith leaders for the ceremony. Abbott has participated in other menorah lighting ceremonies during his time in office, but this year's event comes as Israel battles Hamas in Gaza. We unite for a cause far bigger than ourselves. We unite for the cause of Jews across the entire world and for the future of Israel. The war is now in its second month. The conflict has sparked a rise in both anti-Semitism and anti-Islam attacks across the United States. Well, good afternoon, everyone. After a chilly start this morning, all of a sudden the sunshine is getting obscured by the cloud cover, which is rolling back in. Next couple of days are going to be much milder and then big chance for rain by the time we get to the end of this week. We'll have all that coming up in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. A beautiful sunny day, a little on the chilly side this morning, wouldn't you say? Right now we're at 60 degrees, which is pretty much where we expect it to be. But the minimum that this morning got down to 32 for one hour. And then, of course, it went up. So this is called uh, radiational cooling. It's clear skies, no wind, and the, the temperature dropped. Some of you had a little frost, a little here and there, a little icicle th thing on, on exposed colder surfaces, but the ground didn't have any kind of frost on it at all. 67 was actually our high temperature. In the next couple of days, we're on the warm side. You'll notice right here that our wind is now coming from the south, so that's gone for that 
strong cold wind over the weekend. Now we're getting some milder weather as the southeast wind kicks it back in. And you can see how the cloud deck is beginning to thicken up over the region. Now, so the uh, cold air did not take all that moisture that far away. It's now coming back in and really it's in response to the gathering storm that's in the Rockies. We've got a very unusual situation uh, that it, I mean, it's not there yet, but it's coming in the, in the next 24 hours. You will see a big area of low pressure develop off the northwest and drop down into the southwest. It's going to be a huge weather maker for uh, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, even West Texas. You can see it right there. By the time we get to Thursday, it's going to be rain, wind, and snow out of the storm. What about us? Well, in the process, we're going to be pulling up that Gulf air. And so we're going to be getting more and more cloud cover. And then when that system moves through sometime on Friday is when we expect them the bulk of the activity. This is future tracker long term. I'm going day by day. You see how the storm strengthens right about there. And then what does it do? Well, it goes over the panhandle. That's when the frontal system will organize and then come through our area. What time is this? This is uh, Friday p.m. All right. Friday night, it'll be on top of us. That's our best shot at getting some rainfall blowing through the region. And then by Saturday, it's pretty much gone. We'll pick up a northwest wind behind it. Tonight, we'll be down to 45, not as cold, but still on the chilly side. And then tomorrow, we're looking for a 71. Not bad. We're looking for temperatures to moderate pretty much over the entire state as that south wind kicks in in response to that developing low. So let's take a look at your day planners. We're looking for <clears throat> those of you in Port Lavaca. <coughs> Pardon me. Only 54 tonight, getting up to about 70 degrees tomorrow, but you're going to see a lot more cloud cover than today for sure. 46 the overnight low and then 69 tomorrow's high in the Cuero area. So here's what we've got a pretty good looking Tuesday. Uh, cloudy and damp by the time we get to Wednesday. Thursday, we start seeing light rain activity as we get a strong wind ahead of the cold front. The cold front is Friday afternoon. And then by Friday night, strong north wind gives us a little bit of a chill. This is going to be more of a rain event than a cold event. So the temperature behind the front is not that uh, great. We were looking for a high on Saturday of 58, but it's the fact that we are probably going to get uh, in excess of um, possibly a half an inch of rain out of this activity on Friday. So we'll be planning for that. That's your seven day forecast. Want to remind everybody we do have a QR code. Love for you to scan that. Put Crossroads today on your phone. Here's Karina. Thanks, Matt. Coming up next on 25 News Now at 5, we'll take a look at your stocks. Plus, ahead of Ukraine's visit to the U.S., Congress remains in limbo over a funding package.
Taking a look at your stocks, the Dow up 157 points, the S&P 500 up 18 points, and the Nasdaq up 29 points. Oil up 9 cents, closing at $71.32 a barrel. The U.S. Congress is in a stalemate over a funding package that has money set aside for Ukraine. Negotiations over linking immigration and border policy changes to the emergency aid package are in limbo. President Joe Biden said he's willing to make a compromise with the GOP on border security, but so far there's no sign of a deal. House Republicans want the deal to be similar to the one that passed through earlier this year. Now Ukrainian President Zelensky is meeting with President Joe Biden on Tuesday. And stay with us. We're going to take one last look at your forecast with Mac plus Barbie Heimer and an HBO series leading the Golden Globes nominations. Plus, here's a look at world news tonight right after 25 News Now at 5. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. An announcement today shared that Barbenheimer and Succession have the most Golden Globe nominations. The HBO hit leads the television category with nine. It's on the list for Best Drama, and several cast members are up for acting awards. Now, Greta Gergren's Barbie has the most nominations of any film with nine, followed by Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer with eight. The Golden Globes awards take place January 7th. And I'll probably just catch the highlights after because <laughs> I don't want like so that. Oppenheimer and Barbie are like neck and neck, huh? They're neck and neck. And you said, you, see, 
I thought again, people are gonna hate me. Haven't seen Barbie. You have I'm gonna, no, oh, but I'm gonna wait till it goes on HBO and I then saw I'll watch it. It ha it's silly. It has a few deep moments, but um, I but thought it's I, not for you. Oppenheimer was Oppenheimer slow, was but it was an important subject. It was the buildup, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's where it got you from. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But the buildup of this weather has been steadily going cold. Well, it was a little nippy this week, mm -hmm. and certainly this morning it was uh, down to about freezing in most areas. Now we're looking for a quick warming trend because the warm air is coming back. In fact, the clouds will start thickening up for Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. By Thursday night into Friday, pretty good shot of getting a pretty significant rain event as a storm, another storm, develops out in the southwest. You know, at this time of year, the storms move a lot faster than they do in the summertime, right? Mm -hmm. So in winter, we've got these storms almost on a weekly basis. So we've got one coming in on Friday. That should have some uh, significant rainfall for whatever you have planned outdoors. And then it clears up just in time for the weekend. And you're saying strong showers to come. Yeah, so this will be umbrella. heavier than the last one. The last one just sort of glanced through this area, but this one will bring a lot more rain with it. So we'll be... And it'll be chilly too. So it'll be like a yeah, cold rain? but not as cold as the, this last one. Mm. Uh, it'll be coming at us from the west, from the Pacific. So it'll be cold. It'll be December. Uh, but uh, this one's going to be a more of a wet system that we'll watch. All right. Thank you, Mac. And thank you for being with us. We hope to see you back here tonight for 25 News Now at 6. World News Tonight with David Muir is up next.